it's been about 10 years since I've done anything, because as Rick kind of alluded to, I've been on uh, quite a journey. But uh, I want to go back further than that for a second and tell you that uh, about 20 years ago now, um, a little bit after our talk on the bleachers, I don't know if we've talked about this in a while, but we were um, behind the, uh, the stage at a, at a youth camp, and Rick had gotten everybody together in little small groups to, uh, it was about the standing on the necks of the kings that have oppressed you, and I can't remember the full, the full weight of the sermon, but it was really good, I'm sure, because it was Rick. <laughs> but uh, he had us all sit around in a circle and share that one thing that uh, was oppressing us, that one thing that was just kind of owning us, that whether it was a sin or something we felt was a shortcoming or something, and just kind of together as a group, we had this opportunity metaphorically and physically to put that down on a piece of paper, put it on the ground, and stand on it. Now, that sounds really good, right? Unless you're the 17-year-old kid sitting there that goes to... You know, Brook Hills, Rick's my pastor, and now here we are at youth camp, and he's the camp pastor, and it's going around in a circle, and everybody's kind of sharing their sins, right? The things that are oppressing them. And like, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of trying to size everybody up before it gets to me what their sin is going to be. Oh, I didn't do my Sunday school lesson last week. You know, or what? I'm just, you know, whatever it was, whatever it was going to be, like, I felt like every one of those people were going to have some lame, you know, kind of excuse for a sin, and they're really beat up about it. And I'd be like, you can't touch what I've got. Because what I was struggling with at that time was, is this all a show? Am I faking it? Am, am I just going through the motions here? Is this, is God real? And here I am in a position of leadership at this youth camp, and I'd had undeniable moments where God had intervened in my life, and I couldn't, I couldn't wrestle those out. But it was something that I really struggled with, was just, is this real? And I was scared to death to the point where I'm bawling my eyes out as it's going around. And guess who's sitting right next to me? Rick. And I'm like, oh, great. He, I mean, what in the world could Rick Owsley possibly confess to this group of people? And I, you know, I was really trying to think of something... You know, maybe 20 years ago, something happened. I, I mean, I really had this, you know, he was pretty high up on a pedestal for me. I'm just going to throw that out there. And then he says, doubt. And here's this guy that had been, whoa, way up here saying, Scott, I struggle with the same things that you struggle with. I don't want to act out of my flesh. I want to always continuously be acting out of what I feel like God has called me to do. And that's what I'm struggling with right now is just this doubt. And I'm telling you, from that day forward for the rest of my life, um, I got a glimpse that there is no pedestal, that we're all right here together. And that's what I love about Grace Point, because Grace Point is a place that doesn't get out its little list and say, well, how much sinning did you do this week? How much sinning did you do? And I, and I think people are so held up on making that list, and they want to see what sins you've committed and what sins they've committed so they can feel better about themselves for the rest of the week. And I'm so thankful to be at a place like this. Now, I go to Deep South, and sometimes I'm going to sneak over to Far East, but I'm thankful to know that there is a group of people that are ready to break that trend. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's a good thing for me. Yes. Okay, if you got Bibles, Mark chapter 5, verse 21. I gotta look at my time. Oh, and I'm good. good. Um, it's a really interesting concept of, you know, with this song talking about the uh, young girl. I don't know. Was that song originally a young guy, and you kind of twisted it to be a little girl? It was really a girl the whole time. You didn't like. I mean, because I would thought, you know, that's fine. You can do that. It made sense. But yeah, that's awesome. So there's um, this girl. She's with her dad going to the market in this song, just going downtown to see what's going on. And what we're going to pick up here in, uh, in Mark chapter 5 is a pretty similar kind of circumstance. Now, it wasn't around, this story doesn't take place around the time of the crucifixion, but there was a trend that happened where wherever Jesus went, a crowd would kind of gather. 
And it says here in verse 21, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Now, I want to give you a snapshot. There's all these people all around, and they're kind of getting all bumpy-bumpy, and they're kind of moving around. I'm sorry, I I extra bumped you. I'm sorry. (laughs) And they're kind of bumping around, and they're getting close to him, and there's all these people... And I have to imagine that all these people, while they were there, they had a lot of different reasons why they would have come. Some of them were just going to the market. Some were just going to town. Some of them, and they're bumping by each other. You're going to get the picture. Bump by you, bump by you. Okay, so they're all kind of around there, pressing around. What do you think were some of the reasons that people, that crowd may have gathered? Anyone? See, what was, what's the deal? Who's this Jesus guy? Let's go see the show. Come on, y'all. What else? What are some other reasons that people may have gathered? Free food. Free food? I like free food. Obviously. I put all free food right here. It was Baptist, yes. It was the first Baptist meeting. Yes. Do you think there were people there that thought he was a faker? Absolutely. You know, that they were kind of cynical to the whole thing? Let's go see if he blows it. Let's go, let's see him do his little magic tricks, and I'm going to see behind the curtain and see how he does it. 5,000 people, huh? What, What other things might they have heard? Are there some specific stories? that people may have heard that are special to you. What, what could they have heard? He heals people? <laughs> yeah, they, there were people that could have thought, what can Jesus hook me up with? You know, what's, 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 what's for sale that I don't have to pay anything for, that I get a whole lot of benefit of. woo Let me get to that show. Okay, so you got the picture. There's a lot of people there, and I think it's really important to hear this part. A lot of people at a lot of different places. I think that's another problem that I see a lot of times. I travel around and go to churches all the time, and they start assuming that everybody in the room thinks exactly the same way. And that's not the truth at all. And it wasn't a requirement when Jesus came on the scene that everybody think exactly the way I do for you to be here. Verse 22. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus or Jairus, I don't know, uh, came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is... And sorry, I do voices... I usually don't do a Jesus voice. Sometimes I slip into one, but I do voices when I read. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and lived. And I think now this guy is Indian, um, which is not in context at all. But his daughter's sick. He wants Jesus to do the, the show, to do the thing, to heal his daughter. And uh, so it says there in verse 24, So Jesus went with them. Day in the life of Jesus and his little crew. They come to a place. There's a need. Jesus says, okay, I got this. This is is what I do. And verse 24 continues. And it says, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. I've already done this once, but I'm going to do it again. I want you to know that everybody's there. They're kind of all... I'm going to do it on this side. You won't even know. <laughs> That's cold. Man. That's, cold. That's cold. That's cold. But there's all these people, and they're pressing around. Here I come, make it. Boom! And they're they're pressing around Jesus, and they're walking through. And I can see kind of the disciples that are there. You know, Simon Peter's got the big mouth out front, out of the way. Son of God, coming through. And maybe Thomas is in the back going, uh, you should really watch out for that guy. I don't know about this one. And they're kind of going through, doing their thing. And they're walking through this crowd. And it says in verse 25, And a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 
Now, I don't know how much you know about Jewish culture. You probably know a lot more than me. I got a chance to go over there when I was uh, flat belly, as Rick says, back in the day. And it was awesome just kind of seeing all the different cultural things. Like if you went to McDonald's, they had like a McKosher burger and all these different things. And certain uh, like elevators on Sunday, you know, you, you couldn't even push a button because that would be considered work. And so somebody else, it, like it didn't even, nobody was there to push a button. It would just go from floor to floor to floor, stopping on every floor because that would have been too much work. So there, it's still there today. There's lots of different cultural things, but specifically the issue of blood. And it said this woman had had this for 12 years. And basically I want to give you a snapshot that if you're a person that had a sickness like she had that dealt with blood, there were certain things that you couldn't be a part of. You couldn't handle food. You probably didn't have a family because of the names that were, were spread around you. There were times where you, where you couldn't uh, even go inside the city walls because you were considered unclean. So I want to get you a snapshot of this woman that's there. And everybody in her life had probably looked at her at this point, at least for the last 12 years, and called her dirty, unwanted, unlovable, useless. She was an outcast. She was a person that was considered literally unclean. And it says that she heard about Jesus. I want to know what story she heard. I want to know what, what this woman was thinking about Jesus beforehand. Because the verse before that, I kind of skipped over it, but I'm going to kind of dovetail it back in like I didn't even skip it. It says that she had spent all the money that she had on doctors, but instead of getting better, she grew worse. And the doctors in this day and age were not really good. That's kind of putting it politely. I'd like to point out their cure to leprosy was to put all the lepers on an island. That's it. That's our cure. <laughs> not, not really doing, doing too much work uh, in helping these people. But I love this image of this woman. It says that she had given everything that she had going to these doctors. So she's not someone that's just sitting around saying, oh, I'm sick. Everybody feels sorry for me. Everybody look at me. She's a person that had done everything that she could to try to get better. But everything that she tried made her worse. And this is where I have to pause and say, uh, I do that all the time. I go to a lot of things that I think are going to make me better. And at the end of the day, I feel no better. I actually feel worse. There's a lot of things that you can do when you call it freedom in Christ. But when you really sit in those things and you say, okay, now does this make me feel better? Not so much. Instead, quite the opposite, you usually end up feeling worse. But it says that this woman heard about Jesus. And in verse 27, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. So here's the picture. Here's this woman. Here's the crowd. There goes Simon Peter. There goes Judas. There goes Thomas. There goes everybody. And Jesus is in the middle of them. And she's just kind of hiding over here. She doesn't want to make a big scene. She doesn't want people to go crazy and fuss over her. But she sees them go by, and there's Jesus. And she says, if he is who he says he is, if this guy has the power that they have talked about, I don't even need a big show. I can just touch the edge of his clothes, and it's going to change me forever. And it says she reached out, he came by, she grabbed him, and in verse 29, it says immediately, immediately she was healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Think practically for a second what this means to this woman socially interacting with people because of an encounter with Christ, this woman right now can go get a job. This person can handle food. This person could start a family. Just practically speaking, her life has been ridiculously transformed in that moment. 
then spiritually, let's see what happens. Verse 30, at once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? I didn't do a Jesus accident. But I want you to again get the snapshot. We're in the crowd. I'm not going to double bump you. But we're in the crowd. People are all over the place. They're pressing around. They're kind of walking through. There's sometimes a tight squeeze. And they get through these people. And they're kind of making their way. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops the praying and says, Wait a minute! Who touched me? And I think laughingly, the disciples went on to say, uh, verse 31, uh, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? Really, Jesus? Really? That guy touched you? That guy? That kid? This person over here? Everybody touched you, Jesus? What are you talking about? Verse 32, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, listen closely, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Everyone else, at least for the last 12 years, called her unwanted, unlovable, dirty, useless, outcast. And Jesus looked at her and he said, daughter, part of me, my child. You want to talk about a spiritual transformation when you go from having no one to having the one. She had tried everything else, but she had not given it to Jesus to try that. What I love is, and I've bumped into you 19 times tonight, I've been counting. The reason I've done that is because there were a lot of people in that marketplace that bumped into Jesus and went home unchanged. Went home exactly like they came. Each one of us here, this is probably not your only church rodeo. You probably visit somewhere else. You probably do some other things, another Bible study, another, whether it's your quiet times you do each day. You have opportunities built into your life already where you have an encounter with God, be it through the Word, through, through just hanging out with somebody, another believer, and you have an opportunity each time that takes place to bump into Jesus, to bump into truth and say... That's nice. And go home totally unchanged. Or you can take advantage of your encounter, of your moment, and do what this woman did, which was she reached out with faith and said, I've tried everything else. I got nowhere else to go. I'm going to try Jesus. And somebody might say, Oh, that's not a very deep faith. She's going to try Jesus. I beg you to try with that kind of faith that says, I've got nothing else. I'm just going to grab hold of this. This week, to find a moment where you can reach out and really, really expect God to do something big. And even if you don't expect it, just come to that place and say, I got nothing else. Here I am. And try that. Thank you, guys. It's an awesome time. Thank you, brother.